Um, well, thank you all for coming. Um, as Jim said, we will be um, doing a presentation and doing the audio clips, but definitely at any point in the presentation you have questions, uh, feel free to ask. We're more than happy to answer them at that time. And we'll also have a Q&A at the end of it as well. So, so excuse me. <laughs> Let me start by just giving you a little background on how this study was conceived. Um, originally, Jim, Miranda, and I were asked to do a study on how, uh, WorldCat, how our students used WorldCat Loco. Uh, we knew we didn't want students to find known items, but we wanted to see if they could effectively find materials using WorldCat Loco. From there, we got a little bigger in our thinking, and we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to see not only how students would use WorldCat Loco, but how do they use our uh, resources in general, and are they effectively using those as well? Uh, so we realized we'd have to conduct two separate studies, so that 13 hours that Jim mentioned, six and a half of it was viewing videos on our WorldCat local study, and the other six and a half was viewing videos for this particular study that we originally called the general study. Uh, with the general study, students were allowed to go anywhere to retrieve materials. Uh, students were given a thesis statement and were asked to find specific materials, books, articles, um, as well as an encyclopedia, and also explain why they chose this item. So with this particular study that we did, we did not want students to find known items. We wanted them to look for unknown items. So that's where the thesis statement and then just specific uh, requests came in. Uh, we are in the midst of doing a literature review uh, for this study. A more thorough one will be done later. Uh, what we've seen so far are a lot of focus groups or questionnaires that other librarians have done, uh, but nothing that's really emulated what we've done with our study. So email was sent to students letting them know that we need them for a library resource uh, study. And we received over 300 responses. And it was a first come, first reply basis on who got into the study. Uh, students did get a $25 gift card to the bookstore for participating. When we contacted our participants, we let them know that the study was designed to see how they found sources uh, for the research paper. We let them know that we were not testing them but just wanted to see, um, we were interested in their research process and what tools they used to find, like I said, materials for it. Uh, we let them know that the study would take approximately 30 to 45 minutes and that we'd be using screen capture and audio to document it. Uh, we did not ask students to record their names. Uh, we asked for year, major, and gender. Uh, once the students were situated in the room, uh, we gave them an envelope with directions. We asked if they had any questions um, to let us know, you know, at that point. And if they had a, if there was a question on the uh, form that they couldn't answer, we said, you know, you can stop, you know, don't, you don't have to try to answer it. You can stop, but let us know. If you were, had to find an article, would you then, and you couldn't find it, would you ask a faculty person? Would you ask a librarian, a parent, or friend? How would you go about seeking help? Uh, once instructions and questions were done, we began to record the students and then left the room, letting them know to come back to our office afterwards to fill out another short questionnaire and also to get their gift card. So this is a scenario that we um, gave to our students. We asked them to find two books, a scholarly article written within the last five years, one written within the last 10 years, an encyclopedia article based on the above thesis statement, genetically modified foods uh, will positively affect developing countries. Uh, we also told them to explain why they selected these items. Uh, we reminded students to approach this as they would any of their pa other papers, uh, meaning to go anywhere they'd go for their materials. Uh, and in a moment, we'll see the results from that study. Um, just to give you a little background on the students, um, gender was split evenly, six female and uh, six men. Majors, all of those are represented once, except for biology, we had three students, and global business leadership, we had two from there. And then for the class, we had three freshmen, three sophomore, two juniors, and four seniors participate. And then for the GPAs, um, the females averaged out to be 3.5, and then the males were 3.18. So not a huge uh, difference in this particular study. So. so this is how we went about scoring for um, the general study. The f efficiency score was measured how quickly and eloquently uh, the students arrived at their answer with the search method they chose. 
Um, it was scored on a scale from one to five, with five being the most efficient and one the least. Um, it was a subjective score that we had to discuss and agree on, so there wasn't a rubric, nor was there a scientific method um, used with it. Um, but this was the only way we felt that we could um, get a feel on how the students used the tools. Uh, factors, though, used in scoring uh, were in finding the source, number of false starts, uh, dead ends, and logical use of search terms. The acceptability of their source was based on whether or not we'd accept the source based on the information that they had available to them when they chose it. So if it was an article and we were asking for a book, uh, we'd probably score them lower. And, and any other notes in the t citation that would indicate the type of material they selected. Some students, uh, again, were looking for a scholarly articles and they were selecting editorials. So we would mark them down for that. So after six and a half hours of viewing, uh, we had the result. And uh, I just wanted to say we are, you are all more than welcome to sit and watch that video if you want to. We still have it all. So. So this is a compilation of the places the student went to find the books for uh, the, each of the two questions we asked. Um, so 71% of the books were found in WorldCat Local, uh, with Google coming in second with 17%. Um, nine of the students, we did give a score of a five for they were uh, most efficient in finding the materials. And 18 or 75% of the books were acceptable sources. Um, this is a compilation of the places students went to find articles for each of the two questions we asked. 50% uh, of the articles were found using Academic Search Premier, uh, with Google Scholar uh, coming in with 29%. We did have one student uh, use CINEL, but that was a complete accident. I don't think she even realized she was in CINEL. She started off in WorldCat Local, selected the Find It button, which took her to the CINEL database, which is a health um, database nursing nutrition, and then just started putting in her keywords to um, find an article. So I don't think she really realized that's where she was. Twelve of the students were uh, most efficient in finding articles, and 16 of the sources were acceptable, we thought were acceptable. Um, for encyclopedias, all of those are represented once, um, except for access science. Um, students um, went there three times. Britannica was twice, as well as Credo Reference was twice. Um, ten of them were acceptable sources. The two that were not was one student found an article on food labeling, and the other one chose an article about the Green Party. Um, eight of them were efficient in finding an um, encyclopedia article. Um, they also all mentioned how they never used or really didn't need to use encyclopedias, and surprisingly none of them went to Wikipedia to answer this particular question. Uh, the only time we saw them doing that was when they just wanted to get some background information on GMOs. So. And then this was just, we threw this together, um, who was using Google, uh, more males than females were, and it was also our juniors and seniors that we're going to uh, Google more than our underclassmen. Uh, and then these were the book um, by Michael Roos and David Castle. We saw repeatedly students choose this one, and then the article was um, repeatedly being um, selected by students as well. So, okay, so now, whoops, we're gonna get out of here, and I'm gonna get this, and then Miranda's gonna finish up. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to show you um, about eight different clips. So the first clip that we have is a student um, in the science with a GPA of a 3.03. Um, it shows her finding a book in WorldCat Local, then searching for the book in Amazon. And I'm just going to stop her right there, and I'm going to start the clip so you can see what happens. Oh, that is okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, this says, let them eat precaution, how politics is undermining the genetic revolution in agriculture. Oh gosh, this doesn't have a summary either. Well, in that case, I'm just going to copy and paste this to like 
probably Google because I want to read what it's about. Oops. That's not what I wanted to do. Google. Copy paste. Okay, and this one says it's on Amazon, so hopefully they'll have a summary. No, I don't use Amazon very often, so it might take me a minute. Oh, book description. This book brings together experts from a variety of perspectives on bioengineered food, which holds the promise of radically reducing hunger in the third world, but which is mired in political controversy. Okay, that sounds great. And judging by the picture, and we shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but um, the picture is of, I'm sure, a third world country. Um, looking, Kids looking like they're starving, and it, there's adults in the background. Um, very little clothing. Typical picture of starvation. I'm going to choose this one, so I'm going to write this one down on my sheet. Let them eat precaution. Okay, so while the student did mention the book description, the same then that was also available in World Cat Loco, um, it appears that she largely uh, based choosing that book on the cover. So, okay, so this, oops, that's mine. Okay, so the second clip is a student in the science, again, with a GP of 3.03. Um, this clip shows a student evaluating two book selections. You can hear him discussing why books are better at times than journal articles. I want to check out the abstract of them, because I'm assuming it's available here. So that's at least what it said. Yep. This is another secondary source to offer various opinions on the controversial topic. All right, well, that would actually sound really good, because it provides a lot of essays, and it's a collection of them. So that book will be very useful. So I'm going to take that one. Because you always need a lot of viewpoints for your topic, both for and against. And since scholarly articles are probably the most brief, but very for and very specific, this can also probably provide some against that I can use in my arguments, which I like, because then I can disprove them especially this is a collection of a lot of things. And it's also pretty recent, so that's nice. 2004 is pretty good. This sounds actually very good then. Because this sounds like it's against how politics are restricting. Unfortunately, it's out, but for all practical purposes, it sounds like it would work lovely. Radically Reducing Hunger in the Third World. That is lovely for my topic because those are usually developing countries and how this could benefit them. So that sounds absolutely perfect. So I'll take this one. Okay, uh, we felt that this student all the way through the study exhibited uh, really good research behavior. Um, this next clip is a student in the social sciences with a GPA of 3.25, and it shows um, the student analyzing. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we told them. Yeah, and then we also, with the form. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yeah, and then with the form that we gave them, we also told them to write down the source they chose and then the reason why, so we'd also have kind of a backup that way, so, yeah. Um, this, shows a, this clip shows a student analyzing the re reliability of an article. I'm selecting this source because um, from a .org website, which I was trust to, or which I was <laughs> advised to trust, um, it's by sciencemag.org. Um, let's 
residency. And one author is a professor at the Center of Development Research at the University of Bonn. Oh, it's in Germany, that's why I don't know what it is. Um, and the other author of it is a um, professor at the, the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics at UCLA, so, or UC Berkeley, actually. Um, not that that matters, but <laughs> it seems reliable. I have full access to it. There's a lot on it. Um, yeah, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah. <laughs> we had fun with that. Uh, uh, while she uses some logic in making the decision that the article is scholarly, she does seem to be missing some uh, key points in the evaluation steps. Uh, furthermore, she never read the abstract to determine whether or not it would be a good article to use within, a ba within her research paper. So. Okay, so this second, or this fourth clip is a student in the social sciences with a GPA of 3.25. And with all of you being um, people that do scholarly research and have published, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the common trick. Right? No? Okay, well. We will, you will learn something new. I'm going to refine my search a bit. So genetically modified food, comma, developing countries. Yeah, I know the common trick. <laughs> Green revolution could be nice. So, yeah. Uh, this particular region, retreat and encyclopedia use article by using the comma trip. Uh, trick, but she selected the Green Party, um, so she was one of the people that article we didn't accept, uh, which just is another demonstration of lack of thought going into finding articles for the research papers. Uh, this next one is a student in the social sciences with a GPA of 2.14. Um, it shows a student looking at an article when he should be finding books. I'm going to type in the thesis to see what I can find for information. or book titles. I'm currently viewing an article on genetically modified crops and their development uses and risks. So he never seemed to realize that he actually even found a book review and he didn't say um, much as to why he picked the item. He just wrote that he selected the book because it has a lot of information that is related to the thesis. Um, he didn't bother to even see if we owned it either. So, uh, The next clip is a student in the science with a GPA of 3.0. Um, in this clip, the student mentions how he doesn't like to use find it, and he also doesn't explain very well why he picked the article that he did. Here's another one that looks interesting to me, uh, the benefits of genetically modified crops for the poor. Um, but again, it has a find it. Um, it's really a turn off to me when I'm doing my research if I see find it. Here's one with more specific example. Um, 
compared to the last article, this one seems a lot more specific to a topic. Um, so that might be a good like example of my paper. So I definitely, I don't know if I don't want to read the whole article on this, um, but I could definitely probably use this on my paper. So I'd probably write it down on my bibliography. Okay, and so it seems regardless of the art article topic, which this one was about cotton, uh, students will figure out a way to use it within their paper. Um, we have two more. So uh, this clip is a student in the science with a GPA of 3.46. Um, it shows the student explaining her decision to use the article based solely on the year and title of it. To biotechnology and alleviating malnutrition in developing countries. This looks like a very good article, except I don't think it's in the past 7, 11, 12. Past, past five years, written in 2007. Bada boom. So, <laughs> she needed to find an article within the last five years, which she obviously did, uh, but she picked this one because as she wrote, it dealt with the benefit to developed countries through the enhancement of food. So, um, and then this final clip is a student in the science with a GPA of 3.03. Um, she does a good job using decent keywords and limiting her articles uh, to get, get the scholarly, yet see which one she ends up picking. And then in the next one, I'm gonna type in Hunger. Okay. The first one is a periodical. Um. Scholarly journals. I'm just looking to see how I can narrow this in any way. I, I just want a scholarly article, so maybe I should type academic journals instead of all results for the source type. Oh, number two, right away, and it was November 11th, or November 2011, titled Preventing Hunger, Biotechnology is Key. I'm going to click on that. Abstract, the author discusses the need of African countries to adopt new biotech tools to survive loss of agricultural productivity brought by ecological disruptions and rising population. The author states that new African countries are growing genetically modified crops which help farmers boost disposable income. He also discusses the use of African countries of green revolution to help raise nutritional status and the unintended ecological benefits of biotechnology application. This sounds really good. I think I will write this one down. And I like that it's current. That's really stressed in my biochem class. Make sure it's current. I don't know if you were able to see, but the document type for that one was an opinion piece. So, okay. so that was it for the clips. Um, just from Okay, so these were our observations from the general tests. Um, students are very persistent. Uh, they do not give up. At times, we would be yelling at the screen for them to give up, but they would just continue to try to find whatever it was that they needed to find. Not while they were there. No, 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 no. While we were watching them, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, efficiency of the process students used in the general test was overall quite good. Um, when we looked at the efficiency scores for all students, we saw that two. Uh, students received five, so most efficient uh, for each resource uh, they found. Uh, most had a mix of that score. Uh, again, with the acceptability of the sources students chose, they were overall quite uh, good. Uh, when we looked at the acceptability scores for all students, we saw that only three students had um, the fives were acceptable, and then everybody else had a mix. Uh, if students cannot find what they are looking for on the first page, they will then redo their keyword searches, assuming that that was what was causing the problem to begin with. Um, they can go off topic or start to become more general in their search really quickly, but can't necessarily say why they're doing it. So 
So we would have students start off, um, you know, looking for gen genetically modified foods, then expanding out to genetically modified crops, and then picking articles about cotton, genetically modified cotton. Um, they have a very short attention span, uh, we notice, and that they want the instant gratification. Um, they talk a lot about wanting scholarly articles, but they don't put the work into figuring out if something actually is scholarly. Oh, yeah. Get keep going. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no student went to our um, subject-specific databases. You know, we have those research guides. Um, not even the environmental uh, studies or biology students. Um, they all just avoided the subject guides. They went straight to academic search premier or someplace else. Key use, you, keywords used were uh, genetically modified foods or genetically modified foods and developed countries. Occasionally they would type in the entire thesis statement. Um, not a lot of thought, we felt, went into why they would select an item and also what they would do with it. Uh, we had two students that we felt did a very good job at um, explaining why they thought the source was good, how they would actually use it within their paper, and I believe it was a biology student and a theater communication student. Um, we also observed that they don't read or comprehend what they read. Um, it seems they have so much information available to them, they don't often take the time to read critically or for real comprehension. And instead, they scan and look for the keywords, and if they see them, they consider the resource to be acceptable to them. Um, students can tell you what an article is about based on its title. We had several students just look at the title and then tell us what that paper was going to be all about and how it would work well within their research paper. Um, so our study, we felt, didn't emulate how uh, students would approach research for their classes. Um, and these observations can be summed up in a few words. Uh, students are not critical thinkers. Uh, as I mentioned before, we had two students out of the 12 we observed in the general study um, actually put some serious thought into why they would use the sources they chose for the research paper on this topic. All the others seemed to be concerned with finding sources for their paper, but not necessarily having a clue on how to evaluate them or how they would then use them later on within their paper. And I do believe they will find a way to use them in their paper. I just don't think, you know, at the time, they just, it just seemed like they knew they needed to get these sources, and that was it. Um, see, students seem to be looking for hard and fast rules, and do not seem to be a lot of, put a lot of, do not seem to want to put a lot of thought and time into the assignment that they have. So we did have um, a questionnaire um, at the end so that students had to do before they received their gift card. Uh, we basically asked them um, their use of the library. Um, did they receive research assistant? Um, if so, from who? And how they use the library and how often they are using it. Um, this question I did pull out was one that I thought might be interesting to look at. Um, how often have your courses required papers or research projects involving the use of the library? And 39% said less than twice a semester. So, um, okay. uh, these were a few things that we did learn if we were to do this again. We would definitely have Kleenexes available. Lots of, it's very interesting how much these speakers can pick up. We were very startled when a lot of times when they would sneeze. And Clorox wipes, so we can just kind of get all the germs out of there. Uh, we'd also probably have students start at the campus homepage. For this, we did have them start at the library homepage. So it could have influenced um, where they went to find their sources. Uh, we'd also delete the browser history. Um, we had a student choose an item simply because she noticed that it had been chosen quite a few other times. And we did do this within the library, so we possibly would do it in another environment too. Um, I don't know if it really um, affected how they went about looking for their materials or anything, but it might be something we would consider again. So to answer our uh, original questions, do students use our library databases? Yes, um, as you saw in the results in the general study, 71% used local to find books, 50% uh, used academic search from to find their articles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 
They, for this particular study, they were physically in the library, so I don't know if, yeah, if we had it maybe in another building on campus, if that would have affected their decision to use library resources more or less. Oh, that I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's a, probably a good question to maybe clarify if we were doing it again. Sorry. Um, do they understand how to use our databases? I think yes and no. Um, I think, you know, as librarians we can, you know, explain keywords better, keyword searching. A lot of times they would just put GMOs in there and, and it was really kind of frustrating because I wanted to go genetically modified foods, put that in there. Um, and I, you know, obviously explain find and how it's useful. Um, but I think more discussion between ourselves and the faculty on uh, scholarly articles definitely need to be done with the students. And, um, you know, with the last question, it appears that students do not go beyond or do more than what, they are, what is asked of them. Um, if students do not find what they are looking for on the first page of the results, they change either search engines or put different keywords in. Uh, they do not analyze the material they are reading well, and they lack comprehension and the critical thinking skills. So, at this point, any questions? The students told that they were going to be evaluated on the quality of the sources they picked? Yes, that was explained to them just as well. I mean, you know, we, I guess they probably didn't know that because we just told them we wanted to know why uh, they chose the resources that they, they okay. chose. Thanks. You know. I was wondering if uh, students saw this as an exercise in finding stuff or as an exercise in how to do research and if the instructions were such that it was obvious that it was research. Did you, oh, you want me to try to answer? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, the instructions, you know, were that we were wanting to see how they approached research. You know, we didn't care where they went. We just wanted to see, you know, if they were using our resources and, um, you know, how they would go about finding articles for a thesis statement. I mean, we, when we wrote it out, we said, you know, we gave them a little introduction that said, you know, your faculty or your professor wants you to find um, pieces of info or, you know, resources for this particular thesis statement. You know, these are what you need to find and you also need to explain why you found those articles. So, I mean, I think it was clear to them. I think our instructions were clear. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, based on what the students verbalized in the videos over and over, I mean, they would say very often, I would use this in my paper. I mean, they were, they were clearly assuming that the, the guise of, I will be writing a paper on this topic, right. and so I'm looking for sources for my paper. Um, so it seemed that they were, yes, going under the assumption that I'm trying to find stuff that's going to be a good underpinning for this thesis statement that I ostensibly wrote, even though it's actually, you know, been given to me. Mm -hmm. They seemed to take it pretty seriously, yeah. especially given the amount of time they spent. I mean, we had some students who spent over 40 minutes, and when we walked them in the room, we said, this will take about 20 minutes. Um, if you get stuck, just stop. And there was one student at least that I had to break in and say are you okay you've been in here a long time and he said yeah yeah I'm just I'm just finishing up and when we listened to his 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 video yeah I mean he was really taking it really seriously so I think when they started out probably when they first started doing it uh, they were probably thinking well, I'm just gonna write down some sources and get the heck out of here but they seemed to as they worked through it mm -hmm. they seemed to kind of get the mindset of I'm actually writing this paper I'm really seriously thinking so yeah, I mean, I think that we kind of knew going into it that probably the first five minutes or so of every video was probably not gonna be where the bulk of our attention should go because that's when they're still kind of just going, I'm gonna get 25 bucks and get out of here. But after that, they started to really mm -hmm. seem to get into the exercise just based on what they verbalized. I mean, you could, they, it was really quite amazing how tenacious they were. Yeah, it was a fake assignment. You know, none of them selected the first book that came up or the first article that came up. I mean, they might not have gone beyond the first page of their search, 
but they definitely didn't like Miranda say go okay well here's the first book I got that one done here's the first article I got that one done so yeah they did seem to um, look approach this as if it was a real assignment yeah we saw a lot of them look at entries and reject them for mm -hmm. various reasons say this wouldn't really fit my paper or this wouldn't work for my argument so it was actually quite astonishing we expected to see more you know 10 minutes in and out yeah. and we did so mm -hmm. we were really quite surprised actually yeah. The student who was turned off by the find it button, <laughs> was that because he was afraid that it would be in print form and he'd have to go to the library, physically go to the library to find it? You know, I don't know. All I can, I can guess that just from hearing students and working with them a lot of times um, that we might not have it, so they don't want to even take the that step of hitting the find it to see if it's available in another database I think they just automatically soon if I have to hit the find it we're not going to own it so I'm not going to take the time to request it through interlibrary loan that would be I know I know but I don't think they you know because they don't see if the full text within right next to it they don't they still don't want to take that time to do that one little step no no if that was if they knew how to, I mean, that was just something that they could have done. And some of them did do that. I mean, the one that was in, uh, the student that was ex, I don't think realized she was in CINAHL was because she hit the find it button, saw that the article was available in there, read it, didn't like it, and then recreated her search within that particular database. So. I think what that speaks to, if I can jump in here, because I have the microphone, <laughs> is uh, the convenience factor. One more click. Mm -hmm. is an incredibly high barrier um, you know we talked a lot about how they don't go past the first page mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily because they don't want to see the next 10 items it's because that's one more click and they can go and do something else quicker mm -hmm. um, we found out in some other things and Miranda can speak to this that uh, when we're doing SF, when a student um, encounters a find it button um, and we don't have the full text I'm sorry no how does that go uh, we should have figured this out. We lose 80% of the students. Um, remember? Oh, I should have thought about this before I started talking. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, there is some percentage of students who, who we lose, but I don't know what that percentage is. Yep. I would have to look. Yeah, it was the, the sense of just clicking the find it button and uh, not seeing full text. We lose 80% of the people um, not just doing a quick interlibrary loan request, mm -hmm. I think, was the issue. I just wanted to be sure that I understood what you're saying. So the students did not give up. They were obviously trying. They rejected items that they saw as inappropriate. But at the same time, they didn't pause to kind of dig into the item to evaluate whether it was appropriate. And I was wondering how that fits in with what uh, Jim was just saying about um, another click, um, maybe being impatient in a, in a way that it's is it more satisfying to click away to something else than to pause at the item, you know, maybe page through the article, look at the bibliography. You would have to stick on to that screen and, and dig into it more. I'm trying to think how I want to answer this. Um, want me to take a shot? Do you want to well, start it? Sure. <laughs> I get to start. Good. Um, my thought on that, yeah, there's a convenience factor, but I think of what Susan was, was talking about, um, we saw many times, uh, despite a lot of work on the library side, and I know a lot of work on the faculty side, the critical thinking skills just either, I, I, I hope that they're there and they just weren't being applied. But we saw time and time again lots of evidence where, I mean, the, the answers in a sense were staring them right in the face and they just weren't processing it. Um, some of the early examples that we put up, um, the, the stories that were made up based on a title and uh, uh, the picture of a book, you know, the, the cover art on a book, were, were pretty impressive. 
but had you know no connection to the the topic that they were supposed to be looking for which in in fact and i think in all these cases these people did get back to that topic and and were finding mm -hmm. you know relevant materials in a sense but it was yeah as i say it's almost that whole good enough i think sometimes with students it's it's well this is good enough and now i now i have my five sources that i need for my paper that was assigned to me i'm just going to figure out a way to use those so that's where I think that lack of critical thinking comes in that a lot of times they're like well I just need five scholarly articles these first five that I see you know are good enough and now I can go either do something else or you know whatever related um, I was intrigued by seeing wanting instant gratification and not giving up. Mm -hmm. So th just to pursue, I in what way do they not give up that, that we maybe could um, connect to? I don't, there's times where it seriously, it was so hard to sit through it. Cause I mean, I'm just like, you needed to stop like five minutes ago. I mean, they just, I think some of it was they just weren't getting it maybe a little bit or um, yeah, making that connection, I don't, it was just, it was very painful to see them just continuously stumble over trying to find an article that, or, or a book that they clearly didn't really understand maybe how to go about doing it, but yet we're bound and determined they were going to find something. Whether it was good or bad, they were going to find it. And like I said, yeah, it was, it was painful. It's a big... I don't know, difficult connection to make because, yeah. I mean, they'd give up with what they were, the, the strategy they did for in, within 10 or 15 seconds, but yet they'd spend 40 minutes on the darn project. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the idea that multiple approaches was a good idea is fine, but it seemed that they never really, many times didn't find a good approach. Mm -hmm. so. Just more of a comment, I don't know if this is true or not, but could it indicate maybe that they're that, that they may be so comfortable with this technology that it's just like breathing? I mean, m maybe for that for many students, it's I, I don't know if it's true or not, but but it's it's just such a just such an ease with with it, even if they're not perhaps adept at doing the task, but the technology itself is just so you know not not mindless, but you know what I mean, just mm -hmm. so. Uh, so easy for them. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, in some ways, I, I might agree with that because, um, like with academic search premier, if you start typing in a word and it's and they're spelling it wrong, they're going to get prompted for that, just like Google is going to prompt them for it. Whereas WorldCat Local, if they were typing something in, you know, sometimes a result would pop up for them, but it would only be one or two, and they wouldn't realize that it was because they misspelled something. You know, I think they're just kind of used to getting prompted. In, in that respect, you know, it's different things. And um, I'd just like to add, I think that's a really interesting point because, in fact, I was just torturing Jim earlier today with a piece of, <laughs> Jim, of, of history. Um, I was loading something for the archives and saw the, the announcement of the first computer in the library, and they talked about how it was such an innovation, but you had to go in, you had to make an appointment with a librarian, and you had to formulate your search ahead of time. So you had to really think long and hard about what you wanted to search because it cost a lot of money to do a search. And so contrast that with the way the students are today. They are so familiar with it. It did seem a lot of times like they were almost stream of conscious searching, you know, because they're talking out loud, they're thinking, they're going, well, that didn't quite work, I'm going to try this. And so, you know, cost per search, of course, doesn't mean anything to them. So they are just formulating their thought as they're doing it, as opposed to deliberately sitting down and on paper and flow charting and whatever it is you have to do, concept mapping, to come up with your topic. So it's maybe a different way of thinking about formulating a search. And I would agree with that because, I mean, I think with Google, they can just type anything in and they're going to get a response. But then once they start using the databases, they don't understand that you can't put a whole phrase in there and expect something to pop up. You know, so I, I think that's, yeah, some of the problems. It was striking to me that d despite the challenge before them, all of them tried to function as solo operators. As, as you showed, nobody thought to see 
maybe there's an article in one of the review annuals that will give me the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they came upon book titles that were promising, and Amazon would give them a one-line summary. Nobody apparently thought, let's see if I can find a good review of this book in academic ASAP. Uh, first, is that impression correct? And secondly, do you think this has implications for how we teach folks to deal with their resources? Yes? Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know the answer to the last question, but the first one, I don't think we saw anybody do that kind of analysis. No, try to uh -uh. Try to play uh -uh. two sources off against another. You know, see, seek a review, go to an annual review. Oh, my goodness. Um, that wasn't even in the language, I'm sure, at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, is what we see anecdotally all the time. Yeah. That it, that it's a treasure hunt, unless they're specifically asked to do something else or working on their honors thesis. Yeah, at least for with my experience doing individual research appointments, I've never had a student go, oh, this looks like a great book. Is there any way we can find a book review for it? Unless, you know, for a particular assignment they have to do that, but otherwise... No, for a capstone, I've never seen anything like that. So. <laughs> okay, um, two handouts. The, the white one that came around is, um, you need one more. The, uh, boy, uh, I'm having fun. Here, I'll start those. The white ones that came around are the, uh, the goals for information literacy um, on one side is the, the general goals for the, for the library for, for all levels. And then because this uh, session started out as an FYS session, um, we had uh, produced a, a second set of goals um, for, for first year students, um, as opposed to uh, um, you know, some expectations for, for where students should be after the first year, as opposed to through their junior and senior year. Um, so I, I just throw that out kind of as background for the stuff we saw today and Richard is kindly um, doing my job for me. Um, the orange sheet, this is, well, whatever color this is, yellow, orange, um, is sort of an evaluation but not really an evaluation. It's, it's more of a, um, a thought piece and, and looking for feedback um, in terms of, you know, what were you most surprised by, what were you least surprised by, um, and then some thinking about how we can, um, you know, maybe work together to, to work at some of the things that we've, um, you know, at least shown you here and, and discussed with everybody as well. Um, and I think it's clear that we have some answers, but we don't necessarily buy into all of them mm -hmm. at this at this point. But anyway, so I, I just wanted to throw that in there because I know a few people were, were heading out. Just a fairly quick one. Uh, did you notice that there was any difference maybe between science-related majors and other majors? Because this is a science, obviously, related question. No, uh, no we kind of kept it. Um, we thought this was a topic that um, a lot of first-year students tackle. So um, we thought it was kind of general. Um, but even, no, the science students, I didn't feel tackled it any different than like a first year business student or anything like that. I mean, simply because I, I guess for me, I was sort of surprised they didn't go straight to some of our um, subject-based databases. They all just use Academic Search Premier, you know, so. I'm just wondering if there, if there's one thing that you wish that faculty would spend more time talking to students about to help them combat some of these problems that you're seeing, what is one thing that I could be teaching all my students that would make them better in the library? Am I starting? I got to think about that. You can answer this yeah, question. you can start I, first, I, and then I'll think. <laughs> um, that's a real good question. Um, I think the the. <laughs> Boy, how to get this down to one thing. Um, what I'd like to have students do is, is something what I think Richard was touching on is, is how do we get them to actually analyze what they have in front of them a little bit deeper than what they do already. 
Um, and we've got a, you know, a variety of tools in the library. There's a variety of tools in, in, in all your disciplines to, to think through, you know, what, what is this piece that I have in front of me? What's, what's the content? Who's written it? Um, what place does it have in the, in the scholarly or, or otherwise discussion in your fields? That kind of thing. And I use that generally because in, in, in FYS, it's not necessarily a, a field differentiation or a discipline differentiation. Um, but to get them to, to think in those terms um, would be, I think, a great help to, uh, to what they're doing. They'll, they'll look at things a little more critically. Yeah, I would say uh, just annotated bibliographies, you know, something very similar to what Jim was saying. I think it'd be interesting to see then, or to get them to kind of focus on why they think this source can be useful and, and kind of try to make that connection as to how then they can use it within their paper might be one way to do it. I just wondered if there was thoughts about maybe filming faculty on how they uh, start their search process and maybe narrate it because I, when I was watching it I was thinking about um, as a historian how I try to teach people how to think historically and the only way that I found that I am somewhat successful perhaps or maybe only in my own eyes is by modeling for the students about the questions that I ask and the conversations that I take so maybe if by filming faculty not to say that we're any better than the students but to show how a so-called expert might approach the topic mm -hmm. to provide the students a model to maybe emulate. Are you volunteering? <laughs> I bet you we could sell tickets to students to watch. Yeah. I mean, I think that'd be kind of fun. No, no, we could certainly do that. Yeah, and 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 uh, that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's what your classes are are, are a lot about is. You know, you're modeling research, discussion, thinking behavior for them in addition to, you know, helping them with theirs. <laughs> you want models? Pass. <laughs> no, we could do that. We just, we can't have a cold at the time. Right, yeah. <laughs> One of the things, you know, we've made that reference a few times. Um, we had several, we did this in, in March, April time frame. So a lot of, you know, I don't know, post spring break colds or something. And good Lord, there's nothing like a sneeze in a, in a microphone to wake you up while you're watching one of these things. It just blew up the room a couple of times. I was wondering if other people were taken by Miranda's comment about, uh, about helping them see a, a strategy for this in advance. Because what struck me in, in watching this and I didn't do anywhere near the six hours, but I saw a longer version of this where they're sort of sitting there and spinning their wheels, was, was that it, there was a lot of, of sort of the I'm frustrated, good enough kind of thing, and, and no real thought in advance about, about sort of how or where they might want to go. And so it, what I was taking away from it, and I don't know whether this is just me, but that maybe I need to think about how do I help students think about a strategy for doing this as opposed to just sitting down and starting to click in, in random ways and hoping that, that God provides uh, that you know, maybe there's some, some better way of doing this. And that's where I think that, that librarians and faculty can work together a lot because you certainly know your discipline, you know the literature of your discipline more than we will. We might have an edge on some of the newer tools in some cases. Um, especially in, you know, in areas that are outside your specific areas of expertise, that kind of thing. And I think the two of those, you know, the strategy I think is a, a searching strategy, but also a, a conceptual strategy, I think is what is it. In FYS, when we are practicing these skills, which we're supposed to be doing, um, I think sometimes they really need a checklist in a way about what to do like it, when I was watching the little clips in my mind I'm thinking I wish in that student's head was the little checklist from FYS like for example um, who is the author and then remember oh yeah I need to find out who that person is let's use the internet <laughs> and you know and you can find out what you know one student was in fact doing that how common was that oh for the let them 
the precaution, yeah. the first clip? Well, it's at the University of Bonn, and you should oh, be checking sure. yeah. like yeah. who the authors were. Oh, yeah, and she didn't even, I mean, she didn't do, um, she didn't go beyond what was on there to look at, like, what their credentials were or anything like that. She, she just saw she had, the author. Yeah. And she had it in her mind, though, that that's important. Right. So that would right. be one of those little things in your head that you could have to look, you know, is there a bibliography? Just that little checklist mm -hmm. of things, which I hope in FYS we can get across. This is where Facebook became a problem, at least for me, and, and I'm showing my age. Um, so pre-Facebook, the, the, the way to, for students to find out information about their fellow students was to Google them. This is, you know, six, eight years ago, right? And I, I used to tell fac to students, if you want to find out something about the authors to these papers, Google them. You know, every researcher, most of them, will have a web page or something with their CV, background, at the location, you find out a great deal of information just by one simple search. And they, they looked and said, oh, that, that was too simple of a concept to really address, you know, because it's all there. The same stuff they're looking at about their peers, you know, who they went out with, what school they went to, you know, pictures of them, the whole nine yards was all, all there. So. Another follow-up on Ken's observation. The, the older I get, the more I am struck at how much of our own search strategy is so habituated that it's almost completely tacit to us. And I was, I was thunderstruck by the students in these, these clips who couldn't seem to distinguish between the monthly review and Science Magazine. Mm -hmm. They've got absolutely no sense of the lay of the land for professional publishing and for research and all of that we, of course, take for granted, but we have to be really explicit with them if we want them to use it at all. Since you've touched on one of my pet peeves, this didn't come up in the videos, but it's something that irritates me, which is when students find conference papers in the databases. Because those are not published, they haven't gone through peer review, I've uploaded my conference paper at midnight before my presentation, so I certainly don't want students using that material. So that's, that's something else that I think we have to be think about. How can we flag that for students? And I try to remember to tell them, but there's so many things to try to remember to tell them. So something to get to think about. Conference papers, are in, especially in political science, one of our main databases is, is um, uploaded a great deal of those. And um, yeah, <laughs> well, I'm glad you feel that way because personally they're kind of annoying to us too because they're difficult to find, <laughs> to get a hold of. Yeah. But they latch on to it because the topics are very germane to what they're doing. Yeah. True confessions. I would thank I'll you just, all for well, coming. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Yes, for sure. And um, absolutely. And if you do, um, you know, not necessarily something you need to do before you leave, but just some thought questions, I hope, that you can take a few minutes, think about it. Um, Sarah has her uh, name and uh, address on the bottom. You just fold it up, jot her name down there, and uh, include your name if you'd like. And we can start a discussion, I guess, after the fact is really what we're trying to do there. So again, thanks all for coming. Thanks for the discussion. And uh, I hope we can you know, talk about this more in different ways. <laughs>